Hello. In this video, I want to summarise a short essay by Clayton Christensen entitled The Past and Future of Competitive Advantage that was published in the MIT Sloan Management Review in the winter of 2001. For me, this is a great article with which to start to explore the field of strategic management and the debate about the origins of competitive advantage. It's really a waypoint in looking at how thinking about strategy needs to confront the dynamics of the 21st century. As Christiansen states, today's competitive advantage may be tomorrow's albatross unless strategists attune themselves to the changes in underlying conditions. In the first part of the essay, Christensen remarks on how views on what drives competitive advantage differ in one era and across time. For example, in the 2000s, outsourcing and flexible business models of the likes of Cisco and Dell were held up as examples to all. But a generation ago, IBM's vertically integrated model was seen as an unassailable source of advantage. In the 80s, Black & Decker in power tools aggressively consolidated to match the success of Makita, who was serving the market from a single plant in Japan. At the same time, actually, Makita was shifting to smaller scale manufacturing facilities across the world same industry moving in different directions. What Christiansen is saying is that without an understanding of the reason, for example, it suggests that firms are likely to only succeed in building yesterday's competitive advantage or solutions that do not fit the context of the firm. Historically, several factors have been seen as conferring powerful advantage. For example, economies of scale and scope, integration, and at other times, non-integration of business models and process-based competencies. But do they still do so, is Christiansen's challenge. He calls on strategists to peel away the veneer and understand why and under what conditions certain practices give advantage. Only then can strategists predict what will give the firm competitive advantage in the future and what practices will erode as a driver of advantage. To explore this point, Christensen uses the examples of economies of scale, economies of scope, and integration. For the first of these, the link between economies of scale and advantage go back a long way. In the 1960s and 1970s, thinking on strategy was often built on expectations about steep scale economies. It is the unit of production falling quickly as absolute and uh, cumulative production rises. This thinking lies behind many of the frameworks in strategy developed at that time. For example, the gross share matrix, or sometimes called the BCG box, and the experience curves, uh, as well as the rush for market share. The more share you have, the greater the scale, the greater the advantage you have being the thinking. For example, General Motors in the US with something like 55% market share um, earned something like 80% of the automobile industry profits at the time. But steep economies of scale only exist where there are high fixed costs versus variable costs in a business model. Investment and the fixed costs can be shared across the greater volumes. But Toyota showed economies of scale are not the result of just the scale, 
but the result of specific technological and management solutions to problems. Unless these solutions cannot be imitated or substituted, rivals will flatten the scale economies, as Toto have done through just-in-time Kanban and CAD design, etc. In auto manufacturing, there is now no link between market share and profitability. The same is true in steel production, electric power generation and building computers. Advantage that was once thought to be sustainable has proven to be transitory. So Christiansen advises companies who think they have a scale-based advantage to ask if there is a fundamental underlying cause for that advantage beyond just the scale itself. Otherwise, others will come in and do the same thing or substitute the benefits the company is gaining. Interestingly, he here makes a linkage to his other work on disruptive innovation, commenting that often the challenge to scale comes from ignored new entries at the low end of the market, who relentlessly move up in terms of performance and so ultimately displace former market leaders. Christensen then moves on to consider economies of scope and the product line range that creates it. He discusses how Caterpillar, the construction equipment manufacturer, um, had a product scope that gave it an unassailable advantage in the 1970s over smaller competitors like Komatsu. Komatsu being pinned into a small niche position. That is until Komatsu adopted Toyota's manufacturing techniques and that it allowed it to produce a far broader range and use overnight air freight to change the face of dis uh, distribution of its equipment. Christensen presents similar examples in terms of waves of change in retailing. But the point he's making here is unless the economies of scope advantage are based on a deeper cause, the advantage will be transitory. In the next section, Christensen switches to talking about vertical integration and how at other times, non-integration have been seen as sources of a competitive advantage. He reflects on how doing everything in sight was indeed a mantra in the past and seen as a powerful source of advantage for firms like IBM and General Motors. But now we see this in a different way. Cisco and other non-integrated companies who outsource manufacturing and other activities are now seen as models for success. But he raises the question around, can we take it for granted that Cisco's approach is indeed the right one? Now, every product or service is produced in a chain of activities. And to be successful at outsourcing that to a supplier three conditions have to be met. There must be adequate information available on how that activity or activities are performed, how to monitor it, and what the implications of variation mean. But there are many situations that the enabling information and technology do not exist particularly at the early stages of an industry. And hence, activities where that information does not exist have to be begun in the firm, and therefore integration is an imperative. In general, vertical integration is an advantage where the needs of the customers are not yet fully met by the functionality of the products available. But when the functionality overshoots what customers can utilise, it's the flexibility and the cost in the manufacturing the source of superior profits. So success for a company then comes from focusing on specific activities 
and ensuring that the interfaces between those activities are to industry standards. This is saying that strategists must understand, therefore, the circumstances in which the company and its business model competes and whether a choice will give the company advantage or not. Finally, Christiansen makes some points about core competencies and competitive advantage. Just like with scale economies, advantage from core competencies can be undermined by technological advances. Typically, core competencies are seen to gain their advantage from tacit knowledge. And Christiansen makes the point that over time, scientific progress will result in a deeper, more fundamental understanding that will make tacit knowledge explicit and codified. And once that happens, it is easy for those competencies to flow from one company to another and to be replicated. And therefore the advantage is lost as a result. So again, understanding the source of competitive advantage is crucial to strategists. Now, to sum up across the whole article, what Christians is saying is that competitive advantage, whether that is based on market positions or core competencies or whatever, is predicated on the particular set of conditions that exist at a particular point in time and for particular reasons. Many of history's seemingly unassailable advantages have proved transitory as underlying factors have changed. This does not mean that the search for competitive advantage is futile. Rather, it suggests that strategists need to cultivate a deeper understanding of the factors that lead to that advantage and in which circumstances they give advantage. And to keep testing that understanding. It is also where it is useful to look at the literature around competitive advantage and have the different theories about where advantage is derived from. Not to integrate them together, but to provide different insights for the firm on which to base more robust strategic thinking.